good morning. Well, today we'll discuss different forms or different strategies of cryptography. Crypto uh, manifests itself in very different kind of uh, ways. Um, there's a crypto kitten game, uh, which is very popular. Um, whenever you do an online payment, uh, you use uh, you are you know using uh, the cryptographic web. Um, you, you could see it as an, an onion search a search engine. Um, but also uh, there are uh, cryptological Buddhist meditation ecosystems um, and there are masks, um, goggles, an umbrella, uh, textile and also makeup uh, that is used as, um, as, as a way of subverting recognition technology. And that's what I want to show you today, like different types of um, yeah, subversive uh, cryptographic strategies to subvert a recognition technology. Uh, and I'll focus specifically on, on uh, camouflage and masks, but I'll also show some other projects that we, we have seen um, at art exhibitions over the past few years. Um, so in my work, I look at how artists imagine, visualize, and critique um, specific type of algorithmic well, technology, um, and I specifically look at the dominant forms of, of algorithmic uh, technology. Like not every type of algorithm is being contested or critiqued um, by artists, but there are some uh, types of algorithms that are the focus of critique more, far more than others. And today I'll look at how facial recognition uh, strategies or facial recognition technology is being contested and critiqued by way of uh, cryptographic uh, camouflage and cryptographic masks. Um, who does not know or have any idea what recognition technology does or is, or what do you, what, when you think of recognition technology, what do you think of? It's too easy to use these days. It's too easy to use. Where, where is it used, do you think? Mainly airports. Airports, yeah. London. In London, or where yeah. in London? Everywhere. <laughs> as in, but in how? Uh, they have cameras on every street, so yeah. basically as soon as you arrive to London, they know they could find you anywhere. Right, so areas. cameras equipped with a recognition technology, yeah? I know China is using those glasses already. Yeah, in China, police officers are using facial recognition glasses. They are using it in shops. In shops. When you police enter, in shops, yeah. to offer you discounts. Um, yeah tailored to your habits. Yeah, I think Pizza Hut uh, famously used oh, yeah. facial recognition technology to see who's coming uh, in and out of their uh, delicious pizza shops, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's, it, is, um, it is indeed, like it's used in, in, in CCTV cameras, at borders, airports. Um, it's also used to yeah, monitor, more generally, it's, mo it's used to monitor the, the tracking and movement of people, um, to monitor crowds, uh, and to recognize all sorts of objects. Could be people, could also be um, uh, cars or registration numbers, or you can train it, um, such software to recognize whatever object you want it to recognize. Um, so that's, uh, but specifically uh, today, we'll talk about facial recognition uh, technology. Because that has been a source of uh, controversy and uh, yeah and and contest in uh, in the arts. Um, so crypto strategies in the form of camouflage uh, are you could say you could, they are responses to what what the artists perceive as a changed environment. Their cryptographic strategies are used as a means to um, get a grips with this new or changed environment. So some critics fear that the people that people are being reduced uh, to tools for neoliberal machines. Others um, express concerns about the consequences of such technologies on minorities in, in our societies. And still others fear that the political consequences of recognition technology will be social chilling, that people will be afraid to uh, um, enter or like to uh, particip participate in any demonstration uh, because they fear that it might be monitored or it might it, they fear it might have consequences. Um, and so others argued that the widespread use of these kinds of algorithms um, inhibits our freedom and autonomy. So in response um, to this use of, uh, of uh, recognition technology, it, this is seen as an important change in their environment. 
And then in, in response to this, masking techniques are, and camouflage techniques are used. So these are, these are called privacy goggles. They were um, developed by a technology institute in uh, Tokyo in Japan. And the idea of these goggles is that um, there's, there's light coming from them, as you can see on the right. And this light, uh, this light subverts the recognition, the patterns that uh, algorithms, um, yeah, with which algorithms uh, recognize a face. So often, like a face is recognized as um, like the average kind of di different the distance between eyes or dis distance between uh, nose and mouth, and the the patterns of light and dark um, are sort of the anchor points for algorithms to, to see if there's a face in this image or if, if there's um, uh, yeah, if there's a face on in, in, in the environment that it's uh, monitoring. And by using these goggles, you, you change the light patterns of your face so that it won't recognize that there is indeed a face in this, in this image. Another example is by Leo Salvaggio's You Are Me, which is a 3D print of uh, his face, basically, um, and all in his facial features. It's a prosthetic that consists of a wearable, well, prosthetic mask of his face, and it's made of... Um, of heart racing and it used uh, 3D printing technology and identity replacement uh, technology. So, whenever you would wear this mask, uh, it would, it presumably the, the system would recognize not you but his face. So the idea is that he gives his face to other people for it to be used anywhere. If you want to join a, a demonstration or if you just want to walk uh, down the street and get your groceries. Um, now, if you wear his his face. You won't be recognized by these machines, but they will think that he is walking somewhere in, in Ljubljana, um, going to a shop. The artist uh, Taylor Trust uh, is an artist duo. They designed a data veil that um, confuses data capturing sensors. So it's a similar technique. If you wear this veil, um, it uh, any medium of capture can't well capture. So it can't focus on anything. It, 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 there is no um, characteristic features of form or contours to which it, it can um, match, uh, like the idea of you know, a, a human shaped face or a human uh, shaped uh, body. Yeah, so Martin Buckes is a German uh, designer and he developed this um, pixel head, which he, he calls a mask. And this was used because he says that, well, um, he believes that there's hardly any anonymity anymore online so where the web used to be the space of anonymity where you could uh, where you could be completely anonymous or you could take upon uh, whatever identity you'd like now with all these monitoring devices and all these recognition devices um, there's no s yeah there's hardly any space left to be anonymous uh, online and therefore he developed these uh, what he called pixel uh, pixelated mask so that you can could wear this while you are well walking the streets or online or wherever you think uh, you might your facial features might be recognized, uh, and then uh, Adam Harvey's new project, the Hyperspace, uh, he has a very different tag. So the idea of this it's basically pattern on textile, and what it does is um, the kind of patterns that recognition algorithms uh, recognize as a face, he uses those on textile. So. Uh, they're creating false positives. So when you wear this, um, the algorithm see a lot of faces um, well, the, uh, uh, around your own face and, and how it is uh, designed, it will focus on the textile and not on your face. So in that sense, when you walk around, the machine will think there's a lot of faces in, in a small area and will be confused and it won't be, uh, won't be recognizing your own face. Uh, this is the umbrella I spoke about in the beginning of my talk. So cryptography could also be used in all kinds of well, production uh, objects, such as an umbrella. And here, um, same thing. It's a bit similar to the privacy goggles the, 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 that we've seen before. Is that uh, like bright light will, uh, will come uh, will, when, when you use this umbrella, you'll see like beams of, of, of uh, bright light, and this will. Uh, again, confuse recognition technology. So it, will, it might see there's an object in, or there's a contour or the shape of a human 
walking the streets, yet because of the light uh, effect, this creates overexposure, so it can't capture any of the characteristic uh, features of someone's face. The cryptography in the form of makeup, um, this is actually an application or sort of the, the employment of uh, Adam Harvey's CV Dazzle um, uh, makeup, to which we will return uh, later on. This is one of the things that one of the projects that we'll, I will discuss. But basically here, again, something similar to the privacy goggles is happening. So if you consider uh, uh, recognition technology to be programmed to recognize certain patterns of light and dark as a face, uh, then what this kind of makeup does is toy with these kind of patterns, so basically to change it. So those areas in your face that are usually um, highlighted or dark, say your eyes are usually dark or your, and your nose is in your mouth, um, by way of makeup, it changes these light patterns so that, again, uh, a recognition a system will not recognize your face as, as a face. The next three projects uh, I'll discuss in a bit more detail. So this is Zach Glass's facial weaponization uh, suit. It's a series of uh, color-coded masks, and each color refers to a specific uh, minority group whose data he used to create this mask. Um, Sterling Crispin's data masks. These masks are like what he did is, is, is a type of reverse engineering. So the kind of uh, models that are used to train uh, recognition algorithms to, um, to recognize the face, he used those same models um, to create a mask with, but then um, with a layer of cryptographic material so that it won't recognize uh, your face. But it, th these are the typical kind of shapes that are used uh, to train uh, algorithms like, well, if, if your face looks like this, it will still um, recognize it or capture it as a, as a face. Yeah, and this is again um, Adam Harvey's CV Dazzle, so which is uh, the, the hyperface is his, new, his latest project, and this one uh, is from a few years earlier. Um, and here you could see it's sort of the black and white edition of uh, what we just saw with the, uh, the, the feminist uh, poet. Um, Makeup. The idea is, um, is uh, this idea comes from uh, dazzling. Do you know what dazzling is? Dazzling, as a technique, um, was used in the First World War, uh, basically on warships. Uh, so uh, you could see that on the left. So by um, painting uh, a warship uh, in, in very bright uh, and geometric kind of shapes, when uh, at sea an enemy ship can't detect its motion or its, and its speed and its, and, and its direction. Um, so, it, you, yeah, so that's the idea of dazzling. So you dazzle a ship by using these bright patterns. So it, you, it, you see something moving, but you don't know how big it is, how fast it is, and from which direction it's coming. These ships were often painted by cubist uh, painters. So there you see this connection between art and war. Um, and he uses the same technique to dazzle the face. So areas, marking areas that are, that are usually highlighted or bright that are now dark. For example, the cheeks, um, you know, catch more light than your eyes. But here um, it is the cheeks that are, um, yeah, sort of darkened uh, as a strategy to confuse these recognition technologies. So these are the three projects that I'd like to discuss, specifically in, the, in how they use and um, camouflage and masks and yeah, what we could learn from them and what we could um, yeah, take away and for those joining, joining the workshop to think of cryptography not necessarily in oppositional terms but to see it more as um, a play with visibility and invisibility, a play with service and depth but not necessarily that um, you have to uh, choose between either or. It's, it's not an either or but more like well Let's see how masks show you how, how you could think of cryptography in a more playful way than simply basic uh, oppositions between uh, you know, deep in the surface and, uh, and depth and uh, black and white. And there's other ways uh, to play with uh, recognition technology, be it um, an indexed web or an uh, unindexed web, but to yeah, broaden the scope of what um, a cryptography could be and how it could look like. Yeah, so Zach Blas, his uh, facial weaponization suit are masks produced during workshops that he uh, organized. And during these workshops, um, he sort of collected the data of different uh, minority groups that were, that were part of the workshop. And with each of these, uh, with the data he collected, 
he mixed them all up and then reverse engineered them into a color-coded uh, mask um, that resulted in, for example, the blue mask as you see behind me. Um, and uh, Blas argues in an interview that these recognition technologies control us through making us visible. Um, and against this visibility of uh, yeah, making visible in the sense of um, everyone is um, well monitored or censored or datafied or is um, it, it's uh, yeah you're, you're you're visible all the time basically to these systems um, and against this visibility his mask represents a resistance to what he calls informatic visibility and then Adam Harvey in the middle uses different strategy the the CV dazzling as I just explained so his um, uh, yeah, his, his makeup, this is actually analog, uh, an analog form of cryptography uh, in the form of makeup. And he explains that what motivated this work is that he feels that somebody's watching him in his day-to-day -day activities, that you always have a chaperone, someone who looks over your shoulder. And this feeling, he hopes that th with this makeup, he could you know, sh get rid of this feeling of that you're always being followed and that your data is always collected uh, by giving you again, ownership of your well, data, basically, so that you can decide uh, if you want to be recognized or not. Um, and then last, uh, Crispin on, the, on your left, uh, he believes that we are always being seen and recognized and analyzed, and uh, he calls this by, uh, we're, we're recognized by a technological other that peers into our bodies um, and that we are witnessing the rise of a networked organism that sees human beings not as uh, another s people whose lives matter, but as abstract things. So there's, um, when we consider these different uh, masks, uh, we can see that they have each have a very different approach of uh, critiquing and visualizing a recognition technology. And all three of them use, use crypto in a, in, a, in a different way. So one shows uh, how recognition algorithms work, how the machine sees. So that's uh, Crispin, like what kind of, what passes for a face online. So his, his masks show you the models of, you know, what is considered a face online. Um, so if he does, it shows you a way to toy with recognition technology. So how you could uh, play with uh, pattern rec recognition and how you could subvert it uh, in a, a sort of, well, analog kind of like uh, no tech or cheap uh, way. And the third is focused on, um, on yeah, on, I would say like how uh, pointing to the vulnerability of minority groups. So yes, we're all recognized, but some some groups are more vulnerable to these kinds of recognition technologies than others. Uh, some faces are already criminalized even before, before they are recognized. And he does that by showing the different uh, colors or different uh, minority groups that he feels aligned with and their vulnerability mm -hmm. to these systems. Uh, these masks and camouflage serve as a way to make an individual uh, invisible to algorithmic surroundings. and. Um, to avoid the assumed consequences of what this environment does to you as an individual. So for example, uh, Harvey in the middle expresses concern about the storage and the possible usage of personal data uh, by government organizations and corporations. And he sees, and, I, and this is in an interview, he sees facial recognition as a means of power used by powerful governments against powerless um, citizens. So this, and this is this unequal balance of power is, is what concerns him. Um, so his cryptographic makeup, um, yeah, he wants to recalibrate this, this, this power imbalance. And Crispin uh, states that his writings, uh, in his writings that algorithmic systems see people as abstract things, as patterns and figures and not as individuals whose lives matter. And his masks aim to show you how how this happens, like how, how it comes that you're seen as sort of an abstract figure and not as an individual anymore. So these cryptographic masks, you could say, are um, our response to a perceived like loss of control of your data. Uh, they're a response to uh, algorithmic black boxes and algorithmic uh, monitoring systems. And uh, they're our response to uh, a perceived monopoly of access and access to your data by uh, tech giants and, and governments. So you could say 
basically that what these masks uh, express uh, a desire for is a desire to have individual ownership and control uh, in the hands of users. Um, they are against uh, government snooping um, and they try to rebalance the, the power, power relations between the individual and government and, and corporations. And they try. Uh, they are. You could see. You could see them as um, as a move away from uh, central mediators. So, like, uh, let's say uh, the central platforms, centralized um, uh, networks, and how how could we re regain or reclaim that space that is now so uh, monopolized and, and colonized by um, major platforms and um, and corporations. Um, so then you could then then to think of these masks also as how if you if you want to think about these masks like how do they perceive um, their their digital uh, surroundings and how are they contesting these digital uh, surroundings then they ascribe to a recognition technology a sort of transgressive capacity because it's uh, for example CRISPR states that it it can peer through your body. Uh, um, Blast states that, that it reduces you to, to data. Um, so the worries of these critics are, are, are very much focused on the effects that these technologies have, that this te technological environment has uh, on the self and how this self, how these surroundings are inhibiting uh, their freedom, eroding privacy, uh, and how it limits their, um, yeah, their, their freedom. And, and disables uh, dissent because all three of them state in interviews that they think these masks could be used as uh, at demonstrations or um, by uh, and they they associate themselves um, by collective movements such as uh, the Pussy Riot and uh, Occupy and the Sabatistas. So um, you could see if this is their is this if this is how they perceive the technology then uh, their masks are, so to say, uh, a solution to this perceived problem of uh, um, erosion of privacy, inhibiting of freedom. A bit of a link between these masks and the, the image of the iceberg uh, in the deep web is that um, metaphors have effects, of course, uh, so it highlights certain things. Um, and obfuscate, uh, obfuscate others. So in this, in this sense, if you understand uh, recognition technology in this way, it's very much focused on the individual. It's very much focused on oppositional relation between the technology that's being used and the in individual standing in front of it. Um, and here, the aims of uh, cryptography are very much expressed in, in binary terms. So these masks are non-human. Um, they amorph, formless. Uh, they are unrecognizable, uh, unidentifiable, and undetectable. So this is from being, th uh, from having the feeling that you are constantly, constantly recognized and identified and detectable. These masks make you undetectable, unidentified, and unrecognizable. And this is this binary logic is is a bit reductive. Um, it's problematic because it it assumes that identity recognition can be understood through uh, opposites, and also that the resistance to this form of technology help happens by reversing these opposites. So, and that's, that's bi a bit of a limited ap approach, whereas if you think of how masks and camouflage have been used in history, um, it's far more complex and far more subtle. So that's where um, I want to go over like a few short uh, sort of theoretical approaches to camouflage and masks that will show you that you don't have to think of mask and camouflage as basically f going from surface uh, to depth or from being identity to non-identity. There's, there's different ways to think about this. Um, I have to say though that uh, Zach Blas is an outlier between these three um, because according to him these, these, these technologies consider uh, people as measurable, as knowable and, and quantifiable and that's exactly what he um, yeah, what he is, uh, what he critiques. Um, so, and politically, he positions himself in a tradition of protest movements, and is very much, yeah, very much f focused on uh, what this does, like the uneven um, effects these recognition technologies have on different people. Like we're not, we're not all tracked and and quantified in the same way. 
some uh, uh, some far more than others. So there is um, there's there's more subtlety subtlety and nuance in his works than in the others. So basically, the idea is to understand cryptography not as a reversing of binaries, but um, as to sort of multiply cryptographic uh, strategies and to uh, to see them and uh, not necessarily as just reversed opposites, but as relational uh, concepts. So both the mask and camouflage are very much relational and contextual uh, strategies. And if you think of them not in dualist terms, but in a more uh, relational understanding, this um, uh, so not just like man versus machine, but more uh, but more yeah more contextual and relational. Um, then this broadens the scope of how cryptography could be could be used, could be th uh, thought of, could be conceptualized, and could be employed. It doesn't need to be this uh, all-out war between uh, man versus machine or um, uh, man versus capitalism. It, there, there's, there, there's more subtlety there and more possibilities there as well. So, uh, for example, Hannah Rose Shell, she wrote a very um, very interesting uh, book about camouflage, and she, um, how she theorizes it is, is that camouflage is a way um, to appear to disappear. So you appear to disappear. You don't disappear, but you appear to disappear. And so you recede into the background. Um, and she says that camouflage does not so much pertain to complete invisibility, but rather to um, a play between the visible and the invisible. Whereas you're always partly seen uh, otherwise, camouflage won't work. So it, it camouflage involves the, uh, the, the simultaneous uh, revealing and, and, and concealing. And this is the play, um, uh, this is sort of a tactical play between revealing and concealing, which is what makes uh, camouflage an, an interesting uh, strategy. Um, and also you can see that in this play between visible and invisible, and in this play between uh, concealment and um, concealing and revealing, you can see how technology um, is entangled with our social uh, surroundings, so with our environment. So it's it's about the self. It's about um, the self in relation to its to its um, and to its to its surroundings. So it's not just the individual versus the machine, but it's also the individual, its surroundings, and the technologies that are part of that, and they're all entangled. So camouflage is basically the blurring of boundaries, so you can't see the contour anymore. So that's the idea of the of the the warship of the CV dazzling. Uh, same with the face, but also uh, like if you think of um, military camouflage um, outfits, is that you you can't see. Um, it's hard to distinguish the person from its environment. You sort of you disappear in space, but you're still there. Um, so, or yeah, th this is like the there's this classic description of camouflage by Roger Calois, Um and he des describes it as a deep personalization by assimilation in space. So you you assimilate in the space around you, and therefore you camouflage yourself while you're still very much present. And this space could be, I mean, could be nature, could be the bushes, but it could be a forest, could be the internet, could be a city, it could be any kind of environment. Um, similarly, masks are also very much a relational um, concept. Um, I don't know if like we in Dutch have the expression like to show your true face or to put a, uh, to put, put a brave face on. Do you have something similar in, in your language? Like to sort of the, this distinction between your true, your true self and a mask. And again, this is a very reductive understanding of a mask. Because if you look at um, for, uh, the, the notion of, of mask as it was used in, in as it was used in, in, Greek, in, in Greek, but also uh, in Japan, um, it's there's the word um, persona. yeah persona uh, means both a face and uh, and mask. So the idea of the the proportion is is a complex. Uh, concept altogether because it involves it stands for the masks but also for the parts and uh, for the face whereas it's not just uh, a mask to conceal a true self but it's far more they're they're already implying each other so the part the whole the face and and the mask um, so this this f uh, as for example uh, Marcus uh, Steinweg uh, he had an interesting article on 
on facelessness. Um, mask and face play a game that is infinitely subtler than just simple opposition. It's not there's a self and there's a mask, but self and mask are similar to uh, camouflage. There, there, there's this play between them. Um, and historically, the anonymous mask was also intended to liberate the self from itself, so to liberate people from this notion of there's a self, there's an essence, there's a true you, uh, and the anonymous mask was like, no, there's, there's, there's m I am multiple selves at the same time. I'm, there's not one self that I, uh, that I, that I have to hide or, sh or shield. There's multiples of me. Every person is a multiplicity, basically. Um, so the idea is like if you... These are relational understandings of cryptography, like how you, uh, and, but they're, you can understand them in very oppositional terms, like there's the self and I use this mask and, it's, and, and, and I protect myself, but you could also see this now, there's this play uh, between um, the visible and the invisible, and it's neither being completely visible nor comp completely being invisible, but there's this, there's this in-between a play where there are you're both at the same time. So if you think of crypto, and I made this very lame slides. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when you approach the notion of cryptography, to not think of it in oppositional terms, which you could with camouflage, which you could with mask, which you could with uh, uh, many um, uh, strategies, but to think of it more as Positions between extremes, so it's the position between visible and invisible. It's the position between like complete reduction and excess. Like where could you, you know, when there is there too little uh, reduction and when is there too much excess? Like where this 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 and and here is where also where your cre creativity comes in because um, you could say that masking and camouflage are new. Uh, configurations or like new uh, figurations of a face or figurations of a body and these are creative ways to think about what are the limits of vision, what are the limits of uh, form, what are the limits between self and its environment and this play could be done in, in, well, in endless ways like you could use makeup, you could use umbrellas, there's so many ways to think of this relationship in, in, in more um, creative terms than in just oppositions. So that's Basically, what did I want to tell you for today? Like, well, um, think of think of these uh, cryptographic strategies as a play. Um, um, yeah, make it more playful, ma make it more playful and, and less um, oppositional. So that's um, for now.